take your Bibles this morning and be turning with me to the book of Ruth in chapter 3. Book of Ruth in chapter 3. And we'll read again in your hearing verse number 1. Verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Last week from this verse, we made note of the fact that Naomi's care had changed. It had switched from being upon herself and her woe to being upon Ruth and her well-being, her welfare. We have another thought presented from us for us in this verse this morning. She said, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Thinking upon rest this morning. Naomi realized that Ruth has a need. As did Naomi, as do all, have a need for rest. As we think about rest, We have to think about a home, for that is in keeping with the context, and particularly as is revealed in this third chapter, she was concerned about finding rest. Where would she find rest? In a home. In one to marry her, to rear up children, and have a home. <clears throat> Our homes are to be places of rest. And as we think about the home, there's three homes that, ought, that bring rest, or ought to bring rest. We'll probably only get through the first one this morning. One is the domestic home. is to be a place of rest. We all need homes that are provide that rest. But we all have need of an eternal home that provides rest. See, all are going to dwell eternally, but not all are going to dwell in a state of rest eternally. Mm -hmm. 
Some will have an eternal home. There's a home of rest. And then we all need a church home. And a church home is to be a place of rest. <coughs> you see, Naomi wanted Ruth to find the rest that comes from a good home. The thought was that, that, that she would find that a, a husband for her, a good husband. And under the Israelite economy, one that fit the bill of kinsman redeemer. That not only redeemed the property, but would take Ruth to wife and rear up children. That's noted by what Naomi said in chapter 1 and verse 9, the Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. In the house of her husband. Her husband was gone. Her husband had, had passed. So she was saying, in the house. That was the Israelite economy. One who was near of kin. That she might find rest in them. You see, our homes, our earthly homes, are to be a place of rest. A place where the cares of this world are, are locked out, are shut out. That's God's design. Home is, is to be a place where love is found. Well, and what the things we're going to bring out this morning and, and, and expound on this morning are foreign. To our world today, and even in many so-called Christian homes. Today. You see, a house regardless, regardless of its monetary worth is cold and impersonal. A form million dollar estate is just as cold and impersonal as a four thousand dollar estate. But a home a home on the other hand is built on Love, friendships, and memories. A home is what you put inside of that house, that structure, that estate that gives that gives us warm memories about that place. You 
talk to my wife and you, you'll find that her warmest memories and her fondest memories are, are probably at 225 Sycamore Street, Washington, Ohio. It, it's a, it, it was a place that we dwelled at for 17 years. But it was a place that, that we reared our family. Love was there. Friendships were there. Memories were there. It had a, when you think about it, even today, when you think about it, it has a warm, cozy, fuzzy feeling to it. Not the house, necessarily. <laughs> but what was built there inside of that dwelling place. We have a couple words in our Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24. In verse 5, If brethren dwell together and one of them die, have no child. I got the wrong, I'm reading on the wrong chapter. 24 and verse 5. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. A lot of things there I'm, I'm sure newlyweds today wish, wish we had in our economy. <laughs> Maybe not. But notice the word home there. Its first and primary meaning here is a house, a dwelling, a habitation. Belong down number four. It says it is a home as containing a family. <laughs> you see, it's that which is put inside of that house, in that dwelling place. Turn with me to the book of Habakkuk. And in the book of Habakkuk, We have an entirely different Hebrew word. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 5. Ye also, because ye transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire as hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied but gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. This word here as we said is entirely different than the one back in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 5. And this word here means to beautify, to adorn, to dwell, to rest. Its primary root word is a verb which means to 
teach to hold discourse with in order to instruct. You see, that is what our homes are to be. They're to be places of teaching and instruction. A place where love is. A place where that instruction is, is given forth. It's reinforced. Memories are built there. This, this kind of a home, a home where love is, home where friendships are, home where memories are built, that are warm, that a, pla a home that gives rest, is the result of obedience to God's Word. That is husbands that cleave that stick to, they're bonded to, they're, they're cemented together with their wives. There are several scriptures concerning this, but we'll just go to probably the most familiar one. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Did you notice that word joined? It is the same Greek word translated back in Matthew chapter 19 in verse 4. Cleave. And it is the counterpart to what we have in Genesis chapter 2. Man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Stick to, be bonded to, as glue. Husbands, men, men you're to leave your father and mother and be joined to your wife. Stuck to. And I might say there in, in this note, because we have the same thing. Well, we'll wait till we get to the wise. Not only are husbands to cleave to their wife, but they're to love their wives. That is agape kind of love. That is divine love. It's not the love like this world has. In fact, in thinking about this, I was thinking, the love of this world today is, is a sensual love. I, I mean, they don't, they don't even know what, what a good definition of human love towards one another is. Their idea of love is sensual. But it comes with stipulation. As Christ loved his church. Look at verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And how did he love the church? He gave himself for it. 
Look at verses 28 and 29. So all men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. He nourishes and cherishes the church. <laughs> and husbands are to give themselves for their wives and to nourish and cherish it. Just as Christ did. I've said on, on this note many a time that most of our married life was spent not loving my wife as myself, but loving myself. And she better fit into that scheme. You know what I mean. Husbands, you're to cleave to your wives and you're to love them, agape them, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And husbands are to take their place, yes, take their place as the head. That does not mean a tyrant. That does not mean a dictator. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now that might leave us, if, we, if there was a period there, that might leave us a lot of leeway for us to be a dictator, to be a tyrant under our wives. But there's not a period there. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body, he's not the dictator of the church. He's not a tyrant over his church. If he were a tyrant over his church, there would be a lot of churches that would be suffering greatly under his hand of judgment today. And maybe even Grace Baptist Church. Husbands were to be the head as Christ is the head over his church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 says, the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. We'll have more to say about headship. Maybe it'll click and be a little clearer to you how this works. So, God's order is that we have husbands that cleave to their wives, that love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and that, that take their place in the, in the family as the head. That is, he's, he's responsible to God for the decisions that are made in the home. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse, verse 3 really bore, bears that out. Christ being the head of the man, and the man being the head of the woman. God's order is that wives cleave to their husbands. Oh, I hear it right now. 
Show me scripture. Show me verse in scripture where it says, why is you to cleave to your husband? It says, the husband is to leave his father and mother and cleave to the wife. <coughs> well, let me ask you this. Wives, if your husband is glued to you, how are you not going to cleave to him? He, he's to cleave to you. And that is, you, you can't pry him loose. <laughs> you can't pry him apart. And if you can't be pried apart, why is you got to cleave to your husband? But we also have an example in the, in the Word of God. Remember when Abraham sent his servant To find a wife for Isaac. And just to make a long story short, the servant goes back to his land, to Padaran, where by early the Chaldees, <laughs> and he finds Rebecca. And long story short, Rebecca's family asked, Rebecca, will you go and be this man's wife? She had the option. She had the choice. And she said yes. What happened? Her family kissed her, hugged her, said their goodbyes, and they sent her away. And she left. And went to be joined unto Isaac. be his wife. Turn with me to Psalms 45. Psalms chapter 45 and verse 10. Hearken Hear and obey, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. It's to be joined unto her husband, as she's to forget her family. Why? Because now her desire is to be to her husband. So we need wives that cleave to the husbands. Not every time your husband ticks you off, you run home to mommy and daddy. But you cleave to your husband. And your desire is towards him. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. God said to Eve, and Eve, the mother of all, Womankind, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. (laughs) 
That is, he makes, he makes the final decisions. It's been said to note that God took out of Adam's side and made woman. He didn't take out of Adam's foot and make woman. The two walk along side by side together. He doesn't walk over her. We have a beautiful picture of this in the Song of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 10. And in that passage of Scripture, the church takes notice of Christ's love for her. And she expresses that his desire is towards her, but she also, in that passage of Scripture, expresses her desire towards him. So wives that cleave and wives whose desire is to their husband. How, how may I best please this man, Lord, that you've given to rule over me? To be my head. But also wives that submit. <laughs> to their own husbands. Turn with me back to the book of Ephesians in chapter 5. Just for the sake of familiarity. But he, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives submit husbands that word in the Greek goes to a voluntary action on the part of the woman. So why is you are to voluntarily place yourself under him? You are to defer to him. Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That is, in submitting to your own husbands and voluntarily placing yourselves under him, you're doing it as unto the Lord. You're submitting to the Lord. And, and I've counseled a couple couples and, 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 I, and I've just had to tell them, listen, your problems that you say you're having will go away if the husband will submit to the Lord and if the wife will submit to the Lord. You see, if both parties are submitting to the Lord, what happens? We do what's pleasing to the Lord. What's pleasing to the Lord? Husbands cleaving to their wives and loving their wives. Being the head of the wife. and Wives that voluntarily submit to his headship. They love their husbands. Their desires toward their husband. And they cleave to their husbands. Why? Because that's what God desires that we do. Finish reading verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord in verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, the church is under Christ, and we ought to be looking to Him for, for everything that we do, So let the wives be to their own husbands 
and what they desire. <laughs> no. In everything. Well, that's husbands and wives. Home that is rest and following God's order. And God's order is that fathers take the lead and set the example. See, there's where your headship comes. Not a tyrant. First Corinthians eleven three. Christ is the head of man. There again, Christ not not our tyrant, but he teaches us what is right and what's pleasing to him. And men are the head of the the woman, the wife. Men are to teach what is right and what is pleasing to them. And then they're to lead by that example. That carries on in, uh, in uh, his parent, his father's. Let me tell you, fathers, your children are watching you. Brother French, Brother Ron, even today, your children are watching you Amen. and all your posterity. Grandchildren, great grandchildren, even. Well, great great grandson. Maybe that's why Brother Francis stayed here in Florida all these years, so they, they can't see. <laughs> no, we no, that's not so. That's what God's provided for him. And they are to be the providers. Of the home. Turn with me first Timothy. First Timothy chapter five. <coughs> In verse eight, and I know the context. And he's talking about widows, and he's talking about widows that still have family members. And those family members are to care for that widow. But notice verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, does that get fathers? Yeah, it gets fathers. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, <laughs> that is, those who are, are dwelling in his immediate house, members of his family, that home, <laughs> He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Just to show you it's a biblical principle, Jacob realized his responsibility to provide for his family. He, he declared it. Genesis chapter 30 and verse 30. 
And it was his responsibility to provide. Let me say this. We, we think of that in the physical context, but that's not just in the physical context. We're to provide the spiritual as well as the physical for our homes. Fathers, Mothers, mothers that supervise, the home. Bear with me a minute. I use that word supervise, and I don't use it loosely. 1 Corinthians 11.3 Christ is the head of man. Are you following me? The order. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of the woman. Put that in context of, say, the corporate world. Christ is the head, man the superintendent. He's under Christ. Christ the head, man is the superintendent. That is, he receives his instructions from the Lord. He receives from God's word what is right and what is proper, how that this home ought to run, how this home ought to be provided for. And the woman then is the supervisor. That is, the man takes that and he relays it, communication to the wife. What he teaches to the wife, what it is, but they are to do what they are to accomplish what he wishes, what he desires. And she is the supervisor. She's the hands of it. She sees to it that that is carried out in the home. In the lives of Billy and Susie and Tommy and Carol. Whoever. Chapter 5 of 1 Timothy and verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, Guide the house, the home. That is to be master of, to rule the household. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You see, she gets her instructions from the superintendent. She carries it out. She manages this, that household. under the direction of the superintendent who's under the direction of the head Christ. Is that clear as mud? So fathers and mothers are working together. And as they're working together in this manner, they fulfill the admonition in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, 
and fathers that, that are, are accomplishing this and, and, and giving good instructions to the wife and she's carrying it out, it won't be provoking the children to wrath by unreasonable demands and by fathers demanding things of their children of the household which they themselves don't do. That puts a lot of responsibility on us, doesn't it? But, but fathers and mothers that are demanding things of, of Billy and Susie that they themselves do not do are provoking them to wrath. It builds up rebellion in them. But nurture... <laughs> Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That is, fathers and mothers are seeking the whole education of the child, just not the physical, but the spiritual and physical. And they're, they're warning, they're rebuking, they're correcting, and then they are setting the example. Because Billy and Susie are watching. These things being so. Children will honor, love, and obey their parents. You see, when things are being done according to God's order, God's plan, according to God's word, <laughs> children will fulfill what we have in Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. They'll love their parents and they'll honor their parents. And this will be a home that provides rest for all its members. And it'll be a place where love and friendship and memories are built. And there'll be good memories. There'll be warm memories. Well, we're out of time. Got to quit there. We need husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, today that are following this example. That's the kind of home <laughs> that Naomi desired for Ruth, a home that would be rest, that she would find rest. Shall we stand and have a song in closing, Brother Mike?